like to take you on a bit of a journey. And uh, we're going to try to visualize that journey as much as we can for you. So at the end of this talk, hopefully you'll see what we see. So let me set the scene by taking you back to 1921. The location is San Francisco. Um, as with many American cities back in the 1920s, it was a period of affluence and wealth. Um, commerce was on the rise. Marketeers were well aware of the growing opportunity to sell their products and services. They're also well aware of the ever-present San Francisco trolley car. Plastering the sides of them with slogans and phrases and product claims, they hoped to reach a wide audience. The problem was, as commuters go, they had very little time to read or appreciate what was actually being said on the side of these trolley cars. Enter Fred R. Bernard, an illustrator and journalist who coined the phrase, one look is worth a thousand words, as a campaign, as part of a campaign to sell illustrations to replace words on the side of trolley cars. The campaign was so successful that uh, it actually gave rise to the modern-day image-based marketing that we know today. It was uh, six years later that the phrase was changed to the one we know today, one picture is worth a thousand words. And it was actually attributed to both Confucius and given some Chinese characters to lend credibility to its claim. So the what-if talk that I'd like to uh, share with you today is what if a picture really is worth a thousand words? And by extension, uh, if it was accepted as a universal way of communicating uh, as an extension of our language, what more could we accomplish as an English-speaking community? Would it allow us to achieve greater consensus more quickly? Would that consensus allow us to learn, grow, and generate more constructive action? Would it promote a higher level of consciousness, a higher level of intelligence? Every culture needs a form of communication. The more effective these communications are, the more we are able to understand each other and tr translate that understanding into action. Fundamentally, we all want to be better understood, but we have limited time and perhaps more importantly, limited attention spans in which to communicate. How many times have you left a meeting or a presentation with a lingering sadness that you'll never get back the time you just wasted? <laughs> Sometimes it's in the delivery, but more often than not, I'll maintain that the presenter was directed to dumb it down to the lowest common denominator, to get everyone on the same page. By the time the presenter has everyone on the same page, if they ever do, and they attempt to table new ideas for discussion, chances are the meeting time is already over. And what happens, we reschedule another meeting to retable the issue, and probably in the interim, the players have changed, and so the process starts all over again. Two of the most, short, two of the most significant shortcomings of the English language are its ambiguity and its limited character set. Both of these shortcomings lead to the problem we've just described. In order to get over these shortcomings, we are often faced with the need to simplify our communications, thus avoiding ambiguity. Unfortunately, in doing so, we often take far too long to build up that foundation of common understanding on which new ideas can be built. The limited character set in the English language doesn't help. It contributes to the issue by giving us a limited palette in which to operate. The real issue is that we exist within a digital age where decision-making is expected to occur in real time. And many of our communications are via email or other context-poor mediums. But something is wrong with this picture. We might be tempted to think that the problem is in getting everyone onto the same page. But I'll maintain that that's actually the core of what we need to uh, continue to use, but we need a new vehicle to get there. 
If you look back in time to what has survived over the millennium that captures the essence of earlier civilizations, it's always the pictures. Hieroglyphics, cave drawings, hand sketches, and so on are the remnants that are able to transcend not just time but also language. Even idiomatic speech, uh, at least insofar as those that stand the test of time, are themselves pictures conveyed in words. It's raining cats and dogs. Shake a leg. The early bird gets the worm. And of course, the one we're talking about today, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so on. So perhaps the shortcomings of our language, at least insofar as it pertains to being more effective and efficient, can be overcome. We just need a fresh perspective on things. So for purposes of advancing my idea, let me introduce the following illustration for your consideration. The proposition here is that collective action is only possible once some form of consensus is achieved, and that consensus requires some common understanding or vision. What if we divided this model into two parts? And we said that the primary vehicle for bridging from vision to consensus is visualization, and we continue to use English and the grammatical structure as we know to go from consensus to action or any other form of contract. So the real question here is, if we accept this simple model in principle, what type of visualization do we need to have it become an integral part of our lexicon? In Chinese, visual characters are used to describe both action and emotions. Consider the Chinese character set for wealth and fortune. This particular symbol is widely used throughout the Spring Festival in China when virtually all families hang it outside their door. It is so widely accepted that it is used by both Cantonese and Mandarin speakers. So good visualization clearly needs to be widely understood. Consider another example near and dear to our hearts, the Canadian maple leaf. Who among us would argue that this symbol represents an embodiment of our core values as Canadians? I would suggest that at a minimum, most Canadians would agree that this symbol applies to being multicultural, peace-loving, environmentally conscious, clearly apologetic, hockey-loving, fun-loving, and so on. If you've traveled a fair bit, particularly in Europe and the Far East, you're likely to have seen a backpack uh, sporting the Canadian flag. <clears throat> an almost universal symbol that tells anyone and everyone that sees it that we are not a threat, and to treat us as friendly faces in unfamiliar territory. So good visualizations need to have rich and lasting meaning. Perhaps one of the best examples I've seen recently is reflected in something called the Law of Two Feet. Developed by a group of around 85 people in the mid-80s, the law of two feet says, responsibility resides with you. If at any time you find yourself in a situation where you are neither learning nor contributing, give greeting, use your two feet, and go do something useful. Um, just as importantly, this basic notion has been taken by a global audience of followers and greatly extended by mutual consensus to include a whole system of meeting conduct, organizational dynamics, rules of engagement, and so on. Now for the really interesting part. They gave this whole philosophy a simple brand image, two feet. Now, whenever the two feet symbol is presented, whether in correspondence, email, calendar items, it carries with it all of the meanings of the object. Namely, if you participate in that meeting, meeting, attend a session, or read the correspondence and act on it, you need to follow all of the principles of the philosophy. So clearly, good visualizations should remind viewers of the core values they represent and be action-oriented. But using visualization doesn't necessarily imply that we need to go out and develop a universal set of symbols that extend our language. Of course, that would be an excellent outcome, but probably a bridge too far for us right now. Maybe we need something to get started on right away. 
Visualization can be as simple as using appropriate colors to convey greater meaning. When we write on a whiteboard, write a message in an email or document, and so on, the use of colors can greatly enhance what we are saying. Simple rules like the use of earth tones for bullet points, emphasis colors such as red and orange, and avoidance of yellow, which is extremely difficult to read, as you can see on the board. Advanced use of color <clears throat> can even go further to evoke emotional responses. Colors associated with emotions has long been studied and associated with things like the human chakras. Simple graphics can also be readily incorporated into all forms of communication. Recently, I attended a training session, and I think many of you in the room and online will probably recognize this scenario. We were broken up into work groups, given 15 minutes, and told to go away and discuss a subject and come back and present our findings to the group. The trick was we had to present in visual terms. What happened? Well, of course, everybody said, I don't know how to draw. Under pressure, as you can see, every group came back with very credible illustrations. We can draw if that is the agreed form of communication. So with the recognition of the value of visualization, and with all of these tools at our disposal, why have we not moved forward to incorporate visualization and symbology more fully within our language? May I suggest there are at least three primary reasons for this. Number one, limited availability of easily recognized symbols. Most symbols in use today are highly granular in nature, replacing nouns and verbs. We need to go beyond that. Emoticons are a good example of an attempt by the online community to enhance communication beyond pure text. While they are limited in what they can do, we shouldn't downplay their significance as a starting point for further discussion. Clearly, we need more symbols and more easily recognized images to share common vision. Lack of drawing and visualization skills and fear of drawing. I mentioned this earlier. Most of us would probably say that we can't draw. Is that because we can't or because we're simply not encouraged to do it anymore? Most of us, I would argue, are visual and or auditory learners. If we can think it, conceive it, it doesn't matter what input we have, we can visualize it. It might not be pretty, but it'll get the message across, and in time, and with practice, we can quickly perfect it. Maybe the next time you go to a meeting, bring some whiteboard markers and get up on the board and encourage others to do the same. Take pictures of what you've drawn and start to develop a library of reusable symbols and drawings for future reference. The third most important point, I think, is lack of universal acceptance. With a few notable exceptions, most symbols and symbol sets today tend to be highly specific in nature and intended for a limited audience and therefore not universally accepted. Perhaps the best example of universal awareness can be found in corporate brands. And much can be learned from how these brands are used to enhance core values. But do we trust them? And do they represent matters of the human body, spirit, you know, core values that we want to share and raise consensus around. In my experience, simple drawings that expressly represent collective action or outcome are best. The example shown here is a simple representation of a decision-making process. This particular drawing was first developed about 10 years ago using simple line and box drawing in black and white. The drawing has since been enhanced with appropriate colors, three-dimensional characters, and so on, to give it more depth, but fundamentally has remained unchanged. This drawing represents both a methodology for a group to work on and also predicts the outcome of that collective action. While this drawing cannot be said to be universally accepted, it is growing in awareness and acceptance, both in corporate communications, presentations, and workshops. So what am I proposing? Firstly, let's agree that consensus is at the root of good decision-making and that decision-making is essential to produce constructive action. Let's talk about and agree in principle, if we can, that visualization is the right primary form of communication to achieve consensus. 
and let's continue to use English and all of the grammatical structures we know and love to represent agreement, contract, or action. Finally, let's accept that this is only a starting point and that we need an open forum for enhancing and sharing visualizations, symbols, meanings, and learnings. To leave you with just a taste, let me finish by introducing a new symbol to you today. And I want this to be embody, embodiment of everything we've talked about, the linking of vision, consensus, and action, and the power of visualization. Simplified, simplified this model, the symbol appears as a Mobius strip, the only two-dimensional object to exist in three-dimensional space. What more appropriate symbol to represent the extension of our English language, arguably a very limited dimensional toolkit, into a multi-dimensional communication medium using visualization? Generations before us have recognized the value of symbols and visualization. Some have even perfected it. Is it not time we did the same? This is both a journey and a destination. Let's not let that next trolley car pass us by. Thank you. Enjoy your day.